Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining our program tonight. I'm Eric Sosemski, uh, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the best endo, best surgery, or both for CLTI, how to interpret the results from the best CL and basal two trials. Um, just want to make a note that this event is presented by Viva Foundation, which is a non-for-profit organization committed to advancing the field of vascular care through education, research, advocacy, and philanthropy. In addition to our educational conferences and webinars, the foundation uh, convenes the Vascular Leader Forum and supports important research trials, including best CLI and the companion registry. Um, we are all here tonight um, to discuss two landmark trials um, that, although present contradictory data, I would look at them more as complementary, um, but they have left clinicians um, with questions about how to best care for our patients with CLTI. Um, I think this is a really important program. We're going to really take a deep dive in each of these studies and examine the ways in which they were conducted and the evidence that um, which approach and when each approach is appropriate for our patients. I want to make a note, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about turf wars and specialties. This is uh, the definition of a multidisciplinary group. We have four vascular surgeons, an interventional cardiologist, an interventional radiologist, and a vascular medicine specialist here all to work together to help everyone understand how to take care of what is most important to us is our patients and their outcomes. And so that will be the focus of our conversation tonight. There is no need to introduce our, our esteemed panel, but just in case um, anyone's not familiar, I'm gonna um, bring on my colleagues here. Um, first, I wanna thank and um, um, introduce the PIs, co-PIs for the best CLI trial. Um, we have Matt Menard from um, Brigham Women's here in Boston and Alec Farber from Boston Medical Center. Um, Ken Rosenfeld is not here, was the third um, CLI uh, or best CLI PI. Um, we also have a recording from Professor Andrew Bradbury, who led the Basel II trial. Unfortunately, it's late in London right now, so we have a, a wonderful taping of his um, introduction and presentation of the Basel II trial. From the Viva Foundation, um, we have Peter Schneider from UCSF, Josh Beckman from UT Southwestern, um, um, Vanita Chandra from Stanford, um, and uh, Sarah Sabre from MedStar Georgetown. So thank you, everyone. Um, for taking the opportunity to be with us tonight. I want to remind the audience that there is a chat function available. We will be looking for questions, and in between each talk, there will be a 15-minute discussion time. So please um, submit your questions. We received several ahead of time, so thank you for that. And we also have um, a wonderful conversation prepared uh, to discuss each of these talks. So without further ado, I'm going to have um, Dr. Uh, Matt Menard present um, his um, update since the publication of the best CLI and lesson learned. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I uh, just wanted to thank Eric and Viva. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-PIs, Alec Farber and Kenny Rosenfield. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, best CLI was complicated, lots of obstacles, uh, no question about it. Somehow we got it done, uh, but in no small part, uh, to Viva, and I wanted to just take a moment and thank uh, their incredibly generous uh, donation of 500000 This came at a time when we were in, uh, in great need, and it was a tremendous stimulant to other uh, physician organizations and other uh, industry sponsors to help us get across the finish line. So just, again, a huge thanks uh, for that. Most know that the results of the BEST trial were published in the New England Journal last December. Um, to remind everyone, our hypothesis was that folks with a good segment of saphenous vein would outperform endovascular therapy, and those without good vein uh, would be outperformed by endo. That was cohort one and cohort two. We had a novel primary endpoint of uh, male free survival. Uh, we had the typical safety endpoints as well. We had a number of secondary endpoints, which I'll touch upon in a little bit. We tried very hard to involve all specialties that treat CLI. This is the breakdown of the multidisciplinary teams that we um, uh, established as a key part of the trial. In terms of the primary endpoint, uh, you see here in terms of ma uh, male free survival, there was a relative risk um, uh, reduction of 32% uh, in favor of open. This was largely driven by major reinterventions and above ankle amputations. Of note, it was not driven by all cause death, and this was a big difference between the best trial and basal. Uh, basal was largely driven by mortality. 
Uh, this is the capital Maya curve of the primary endpoint. You see an absolute risk reduction of 10.3 and a number needed to treat of 10. Uh, this is the capital Maya for major reintervention and for above ankle amputation. Here you see the, the lack of any significant difference in mortality across both the perioperative phase and the entire length of the trial, and similarly no difference in MACE between open and endo. This is a subgroup analysis, and um, you can see all subgroups uh, trended in favor of surgery. Um, so our conclusions with regard to the main um, results were that both open and endo were effective and safe. Bypass with a good uh, segment of vein was more effective uh, in, can in folks that were suitable for both. Uh, patients who are candidates for limb salvage should go on evaluation of surgical risk and conduit availability. Bypass with good vein should be offered as a first-line treatment option and suitable patients as part of a fully informed share of decision-making. Level one evidence from BEST does not support an endo-first or an endo-only approach, uh, rather a complementary role for open and endo and further studies are certainly needed. Uh, just quickly, the quality of life analysis. Here you see a, a early and sustained improvement in quality of life for both endo and open across the entirety of the trial. And this was the case for all of the metrics that were utilized. Similarly, pain was improved across uh, the trial for both open and endo um, throughout. The limitations of the quality of life anal analysis is that so-called uh, minimally, minimally clinically important differences have not been established for all CLTI measures. Uh, the study was not designed to uh, capture the impact of secondary procedures, and uh, there are potential sources of bias, uh, for example, those with frailty or following major amputation. Dr. Michael Conti, one of the chairs of our uh, executive committee, presented last week uh, one of the secondary endpoints of major reinterventions, uh, you took a, a deeper dive. Here you just see the cumulative major reinterventions in cohort one on the left, cohort two on the right, and significant dis uh, differences in this incident rate ratio, and also in the incident rate ratio of uh, amputations per limb, I'm sorry, interventions per limb salvaged. Uh, similarly, um, impact in favor of, of surgery with cumulative all reinterventions. So this is both major and minor reinterventions. And the time to first major reintervention was again significant in favor of open. Uh, I presented last week at our national meeting uh, a couple of additional secondary endpoints. This one is a freedom from clinical failure. In this case, the time to clinical failure um, was um, much greater for uh, in favor of open. Um, this endpoint uh, includes the degradation of Wi-Fi as one of its features. Turn, uh, time to hemodynamic failure. We thought both of these were important endpoints. This one takes into account uh, degradation of ABI or TBI in addition to imaging evidence for failure. And again, uh, this one was in favor of, of open surgery as well. And here you see two additional ones in addition to clinical failure and hemodynamic failure. This is initial CLTI resolution and freedom from recurrent CLTI, the bottom two rows, both in favor of open surgery um, in a robust fashion. In terms of uh, the horizon for us, uh, we were fortunate to get a generous grant from Nova Nordisk Foundation. We're gonna extend the analysis. We're gonna undertake a cost effectiveness analysis that's being undertaken as we speak. And we're gonna collect all the trial related imaging. This is just a little uh, preview of all of the uh, studies uh, and additional questions we're hoping to answer. We've got really good people uh, tackling all of the important uh, further details of the trial with regard to all of the data that we have available. Uh, I think everyone knows the importance of the imaging. It's critical to understanding who is in the trial, the complexity of the disease, and the generalizability. We're going to think big. We're going to try to uh, combine our data set with uh, other sets as well, Voyager, Compass, Euclid, Basil, and hopefully validate class and hopefully come up with a syntax score for PAD similar to what's available in the heart. This is a huge unmet need. We're going to try to apply precision medicine and machine learning, and one can imagine uh, the benefits. Uh, my vision is a kind of a syntax score on steroids for PAD. 
Now I'm going to segue into some uh, limitations and critiques. We're going to try to anticipate what folks might be wondering. We've, we've gotten a lot of this feedback already. Uh, lots of people were happy with the uh, trial results. Lots of people weren't. Some patients or some folks were even uh, downright angry. Critique number one, why is Bessalai even needed? What's wrong with just doing endo first? Well, there's lots of evidence from basal, um, from this uh, meta-analysis from the Canadian group that uh, the results of secondary interventions after a failed endo are not as good. Um, and uh, so that's just an important reminder uh, for why um, it's important to kind of make that first step wisely. Critique number two, amputation-free survival should have been the endpoint rather than male-free survival. This was used in basal. Um, our answer to that is we, we truly do believe it's a flawed endpoint, uh, fully supportive of all of uh, the amazing work that Dr. Bradbury's done throughout his uh, career. We've talked about endpoints uh, on, on multiple occasions, but in our view, uh, certainly my view, amputation-free survival is dominated by non-treatment-related mortality events. Basal II would be a good example of that. It underemphasizes limb-related events that are specifically attributable to the effectiveness of the treatment mortality for the leg. And importantly, it excludes limb-related events that have significant consequence. Um, for reference, this is not utilized in the coronary world, um, but on the contrary, more uh, intervention minded endpoints are, are chosen. Another critique, these are not in sequential order because I've called from out, some out for the sake of time. Uh, but patients in BCLI are less sick and do not represent the patients I treat. Um, this is certainly true. It does not represent all patients with CLTI. We excluded patients at high risk for open surgery, initially those with TAS 2A disease, a history of prior endo with stenosis or occluded stents. We did include patients who are deemed candidates for both as judged by two di different investigators, one credential in surgery and one credential in endo. Um, and caution is certainly needed when trying to compare Bessiali to other real world data. Uh, current practice is commonly endo first. Many endo patients are not amenable to surgery. Many surgery patients often have higher clinical and anatomic disease complexity and have had prior endo interventions. Retrospective studies are severely limited by confounding and selection bias. And certainly the most optimal comparable is a concurrent registry. We tried hard to pull that off. We do have an ongoing registry, but um, that's not, um, it was not concurrent. Uh, further limitations uh, when using an administrative databases such as Medicare, uh, the inability to adequately match patients across key clinical limb threat severity and anatomic variables uh, driving treatment choices uh, is a big problem. There's a lack of scheduled follow-up visits and inability to replicate a prospective cohort with regard to incident CLTI. As treated outcomes cannot be compared to ITT outcomes, and one cannot assume that patients had access to providers capable and willing to do both open and endo. Uh, these are two um, VQI registry studies um, that we compared our results to, and they are different. BCLI is uh, younger, less ESRD, CHF, and COPD, but more CAD and more diabetes. Um, certainly more work is needed, but our posture should not be patients in BCLI are not representative of who I treat but rather which of my patients are similar to the patients studied in BCLI. So sort of flipping how you approach the results on their head. Another critique, loss to follow-up and withdrawal rates were high, um, higher withdrawal in surgery arm. Uh, our response to that, this is not uncommon. This is a Lutonix trial. And here you see uh, loss to follow-up of 21 months, I'm sorry, 21% in the DCB arm and 26% in the PTA arm. That's at 12 months. Uh, sensitivity analysis removing uh, this component, uh, we've reached the same conclusion as the ITT primary endpoint analysis. Another critique, trial mostly included vascular surgeons. Uh, in fact, 73% of the endo procedures were done by vascular surgeons. Rick Powell looked at this um, in detail uh, in a prior paper that's been published in JVS 
and the investigative breakdown was very similar to what was uh, seen in the Medicare database, and we felt pretty good about that. Uh, critique number eight, medical therapy in best life was suboptimal. Um, uh, we kind of, uh, this was a self-inflicted wound when he went to the 30-day follow-up, which we did not publish in the main paper. The results are pretty um, favorable uh, to the literature. Uh, another critique, interventionalists in Pesciola were not that skilled. Endotechnical failure was too high, 15%. Well, um, we believe that uh, the centers participating in Besseli, um, uh reported intention to treat outcomes and were, um, the, the trial was a bit different in that industry sponsored trials routinely exclude patients in whom lesions are not successfully crossed and um, results of technical success uh, in other registry studies are biased because patients who fail endotherapy are not entered into the database. I do want to call your attention, this is a Japanese report from some very skilled endovascular cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, and here you see they broke down technical success uh, by glass. And I'm going to call your attention to glass three here in the third column. And you can see a 17 18% technical failure rate uh, for the more complicated lesions. Again, these are very skilled uh, cardiologists performing these procedures. This is a meta-analysis, again, broken down by glass three. Here you have a 28% uh, technical failure rate in glass three patients. In basal two, the technical failure rate was 14%. And in this uh, most recent uh, report, just from last month in the JVS, this was a single center uh, report of 221 endo procedures and a technical failure rate of 15%, exactly what we found in BEST. best line evolving technology um, met regularly. Uh, the critique uh, there's been an evolution of endovascular technologies over the course of the trial, and the trial may now capture this. Um, again, the, we had a committee looking specifically at this. Uh, it's not a very accurate critique because drug eluting stents were acceptable from day one. DCPs were approved shortly after FDA approval, and lithoplasty was approved shortly after FDA approval as well. Endovascular therapy used was subpar. 50% were treated with PTA alone, and drug elution was low. This is actually not the case. Again, this is a little bit misleading based on how we reported the main results. Uh, when we look more clear, carefully by patient and by leg rather than by segment, one sees that PTA alone was 19% and the drug elution use was 53%. This compares uh, favorably to two recent reports uh, in the VQI data set, looking at uh, uh, basically, in their 91,000 patients, the rate of drug elution was 45%, and in a big Medicare data set, it was 42%. And finally, findings in best VLI can be explained by early endo failure. Uh, we did a meta-analysis, I'm sorry, we did a uh, sensitivity analysis for moving all sorts of different ways of accounting for this, and we found the same primary results. Um, Thanks very much. I uh, look forward to the question and answer period. Great. We'll switch back to the panel here. Great. So thank you very much, Matt, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we were just making a comment that I think you uh, addressed a lot of our questions. I, I will say, you know, every data glance that I can get, whether my own internal data or other national data says about 55% of endovascular procedures in the U.S. are performed by vascular surgeons. 45% are performed by other specialties. So keeping in mind the uh, multidisciplinary group, I think it's um, meaningful that we all, um, you know, contribute to this patient cohort and uh, whether it's a medical or an, a revascularization procedure. Um, I to a question to Alec, uh, Dr. Farber, joining us as the co-PI with um, Matt. You know, I think something that was really helpful for uh, the Basel 1 and Basel 2 trials was their audit of select sites. Obviously, it's hard now to go back to all sites and collect data between those who are screened or not screened. But have you guys considered it all? Because I, I think, again, one of the main questions everybody has, as Matt brought up, is 
who is in this trial and who's not in this trial about doing what the Professor Bradbury is working on right now with his center and others about trying to collect some of the sites in Best CLI and understand who was enrolled and who wasn't. Um, so I do think that will uh, provide some meaningful data for uh, some of the VASCO community who, who remain questioned by that. Uh, Eric, uh, I'm trying to understand your question. Are you asking what um, the experience was of the investigators or which patients were enrolled? Yeah, the question is, um, in both Basel 1 and Basel 2, there was an audit performed looking at all patients treated with this condition during the study period, and then those who made it into the trial to get better context in terms of the external validity of the results. Have you guys considered doing this? Because I know they're doing this right now in Basel 2. No, we, we, of course, we consider doing it. You know, like, like Matt pointed out, uh, a concurrent registry is really uh, would be incredibly valuable as a context for a randomized controlled trial. And unfortunately, um, you know, the, the funds were not allocated for that. We tried to fight for it. Uh, eventually, we're fortunate to get it uh, to happen, but it's not concurrent. Um, so, uh, you know, the prices are different in the United Kingdom, and Andrew was able to collect data uh, from his site uh, concurrently. Uh, we just did not have funding to do that, unfortunately. Great. Peter, I'm going to turn it to you for the next question here. So um, we know there are must needed sub analyses. I think Matt, you know, in a perfect world, we, we probably needed to give Matt a few more minutes to go through those. And uh, but he proposed a lot of meaningful ones. Where where do you land in terms of what is needed next from the best data? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there are going to be a number of uh, sub analyses, and I think it's really going to help our understanding. Um, one really promising thing is that there is an agreement between the, the best CLI uh, investigators and the Basel II investigators uh, so that the data on some level were not to be combined, but you could potentially look at the best, uh, look at the uh, Basel patients in the context of best and see how they compare with the best population might help explain why some of the answers are a little bit different. I think the technical failure is clear. Uh, Rich Powell or Rick Powell is reading, leading that effort to understand the technical failure um, situation a little bit better. I think it's wrong to say, oh, 15% is too high for technical failure because it we don't know exactly who that population was. and. Um, I think uh, Matt very nicely showed some other examples of a variety of technical failure um, data that really has to do with the population that's being uh, treated at that time. So if the glass uh, score or the glass staging was, was high in that group, then you would expect a little bit higher technical failure rate. But I think in general, Matt already alluded to this idea of a grant for the to look at the uh, uh, angiograms from the best CLI patients, I think that'll be also very helpful so we can understand a little bit better. And then in terms of other things, I think the patients, although we have good quality of life data, um, we'd like to know about wound healing. I think that's the bottom line for the patients. And then uh, one other thing I think would be of high interest is there are specific subgroups that we really worry about a lot, like dialysis patients. And I think uh, certain subgroups like that would be excellent to have some additional data. And we will eventually have this. This is the fantastic thing is we finally have a data cohort that we can work with on this, so. Wonderful. I think that we all are all looking forward to every one of those analyses. Um, Josh, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give you a question here that me and you talk about uh, a lot. So as the um, cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist here, and this is not necessarily a critique to any of the best investigators, but we know when we see 70% statin use, we all cringe. Um, and we've seen data where if a vascular patient has had an MI or a major cardiac event, statin use goes up. If they've been seen in a multidisciplinary group, statin use goes up. How do we, I mean, how do we use these trials as the point of really introducing optimal medical therapy to the max where it should be? You know, we, we, we really need to change this. This is no different than trials we've seen before. So what's your perspective on that? 
So a couple of things. First, um, I want to congratulate Matt and Alec and Kenny, who's not here. Um, it, it it is incredibly difficult to carry out a trial like this, um, and they did that successfully. And we should all just acknowledge that that was done. Uh, the second thing I'll say is that I've never seen a perfect clinical trial, uh, and so. It's unreasonable to expect any clinical trial to be perfect. <clears throat> and third, the I'll, I'll also make the case that we don't know everything we need to know about this trial or the next trial. You know, there's going to be dozens of papers that come out that help us understand the patient population much better. And that happens with medicines now all the time. For example, Whenever there's a new medication, we end up breaking down the larger study population to see where benefit and risk accrue most to, to right size and tailor our therapies. Here, uh, and you know, I am a lone voice here for someone who doesn't do these interventions or surgeries, but I'll say the journey of the patient with critical limb ischemia is not the length of the procedure or hospitalization at the time they have it, right? Wound healing usually takes anywhere from six to 12 months, depending on the severity of the wound. The procedure is very important, but the patient's lifespan, where they start, uh, and where they are going to go until they can be restored to their primary care physician or very commonly their diabetes doctor is a long journey for them. And so I wanna take the moment to say, this is already a multidisciplinary event that we, we can talk about what to do over a period of weeks to a month, but that's not really what's going on here. And so uh, I would say that it's everybody's responsibility who participates in the care to make sure that life-saving therapies are applied. And now we're lucky enough to even have some therapies that can save limbs, right? There's at least a couple of them. And so I would make the case that if you're willing to do a, a, a percutaneous revascularization or an open surgical bypass, you also should be held accountable for making sure your patients are on all the guideline directed medical therapies that we all agree on in the either multi specialty guidelines or even the society based guidelines because there's a lot of overlap with medical therapy. So I think it's everybody's responsibility, but I do think if I had to identify a point of care, more people participating, providing eyes on the patient from different perspectives, everybody will focus on what they're interested in and what they have they can bring to the table. And I would say that when you have to come in for a procedure for this disease, it behooves all of us to do everything we can for that person to put them in an optimal position for recovery and lifespan improvement. So I think it's a team sport already. Uh, I think uh, we can all do better. And I think we should use revascularization and presentation to a facility as an opportunity to improve medical care. That's been done in a variety of spaces already. And the vascular community is a bit late to making that happen routinely. Great comments, Josh. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, um, Matt, I'm going to turn to you. I just want to echo a comment that Josh made at the beginning, which we didn't, you know, again, acknowledge the hard work that both you guys, Matt and Alec and Kenny put into this trial. So uh, Matt, I want to give you a chance to uh, respond to that or add to that comment. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it uh, greatly. And I, I do want to add to it. So you know, Eric, you touched on a key difference between your world and our world in vascular surgery. You, you can't show up at the hospital having had an MI and and then leave the hospital as if you didn't have an MI. The whole machine gets started. You have to leave, you know, with a, with a post-op, with a follow-up appointment. You have to meet all these benchmarks in terms of your medication. And that doesn't exist in our world. And and the fact that, you know, 10% of patients die a year with CLTI is a total wake-up call, regardless of what trial you're in. And, you know, that's one of the biggest, biggest needs. And so, you know, that's sort of low hanging fruit for us to do exactly kind of what Josh Josh said. The other, you know, piece of it, your your question to Alec, you know, we involved all disciplines. Uh, and what that really means is we involve people that 
kind of focus on endo and focus on open and everyone has their own lens. And we really tried to hammer investigators to step out of their little comfort zone, to stop seeing patients the way they see them. And the benefit of that was that a given patient, you know, if, 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 if one investigator said, yeah, I can do that endo, and another one said, yeah, I can do that open, then that just opens the door in terms of the, the it widens the, the zone of equipoise, which is what we should be doing every day for every patient. So, but it, it was not easy to get people to do that. And so, you know, not every patient got, got randomized. And again, I'd echo Josh's comments about any trial. The, the piece that I'm kind of most excited about is we have data on this patient journey that is different for every single patient. So we know what they showed up with, and eventually we'll know what their exact anatomy was at the time they hit the door. We have their demographics, we know what procedure they got, but then we know, you know, who, who healed their initial CLTI when, who got a recurrence, what the pattern of interventions was. So that's the real story. I, I couldn't agree more with Josh about how the initial event is important, but to me, it's about sustained perfusion. And so hopefully once we, you know, dig into that, that rich kind of data, we're going to be able to really make some, some important comments. Yeah. Wonderful comments, Matt. And I, I think if we can all agree on one guideline recommendation that comes out of best is that a multidisciplinary approach for any care in CLTI is going to benefit the patient and outcomes. And I think that you guys did a stand up job trying to build that into the trial. So, um, I'm going to, uh, take a few extra minutes here. And I just want to ask Benita a question about the quality of life metrics that Matt presented. You know, I think that Matt, you, you spoke both about the importance of those endpoints as well as some of the limitations, but you know, Benita, when you look at that, um, and again, as you, you know, direct a limb salvage wound care program and, um, deal with these patients on a daily basis, how important is that quality of life data in the context of, um, the primary and secondary endpoints of a clinical trial? Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, I, I think it's a really great question. I think there's a huge move towards emphasis on patient related outcome metrics and focus on these within clinical trials. There's no question that it's important. I think it's challenging and tricky in the CLTI world. We really don't have a perfect metric as yet. Um, and I, um, uh, I'm I should say congratulations to the best CLI as well as Basil for you know just attacking it with multiple different metrics and multiple quality of life uh, tools, um, and you know what they found similarly between both studies was um, a significant impact with both out, with both interventions right endovascular and open, and you, you know it's it's difficult a little still to unpack the details especially given that this isn't that these aren't the perfect metrics for CLTI but I think the biggest takeaway is this is important and look at how impactful I mean we keep saying this look at what an impact we're making on these CLTI patients by getting them care at all and I think the biggest um, takeaway my in my impression is. We have to outreach. We have to reach more of those patients out there with CLTI that are actually not getting any care because anything that we do for them has a huge impact. Um, as we also try to better understand what their quality of life metrics, what the best ones are. But I think the biggest one is we can make a difference and we need to make a better difference of getting out there and reaching them. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree complain again, survival in a non-trial population is between, you know, 65 to, you know, 75% at one year. Um, quality of life is a big part of how that year is spent. And so uh, really appreciate those comments. For our last uh, question, this actually came from the audience, Sire. And, um, you know, packaging this all, and we're gonna hear from Dr. Bradbury in a moment, but, you know, when is an endo first approach still reasonable? When is it not? When, how are you going to do something different in your practice or are you not? Yeah, good question. Again, congratulations, um, um, Matt, Alec, and, and Kenny. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, we've been digesting the data. I mean, I was, you know, enrolling in the study. So, um, so in, in our at, at two different uh, um, sites, um, institutions, and um, and definitely we've been trying to reach that equipoise. And um, I think one of the most important things is to um, to be uh, aware of the patient's um, status of do they have a good vein conduit or not. 
like this is probably one of the biggest takeaways that we have that um, I think we're not not been paying as much attention to. And I think once you start enrolling in a trial and now now it's published and people need to pay more attention to it is to be aware of this before going into the case. Now, the question becomes like, do we need to do it before every patient? And that is the, the biggest point that we're, we're struggling with now is, uh, you know, who, who should should get evaluation you know, for bay mapping before every case or not. The anatomy is going to be the most important thing that I'm looking forward to and a lot in the community are looking forward to. You know, a infrapopliteal lesion, the just focal AT occlusion, you know, in a wound that is in that in that angiosome, you know, doesn't matter as much. Probably, you know, most patient most people will just treat it endo based on that. I mean, a long trifurcation disease, calcified, you know, complex vent pop, before I try endo there, I want to see what that what the what the vein status is. The good vein, maybe just defer. Um I just could I mean all of the last eight months I could recall one case where this came into play where you know, you do an angiogram, you find a long occlusion, you try to cross it. Now you realize you need to do a pedal access. Well, the patient had a vein, so just back off and then send the patient for a bypass. But the overwhelming majority of the patients don't have a good conduit or the, the, the nature of the lesion is not that significant to cross that you think you can do it. Now, this is not what's supported by the study. The study, you know, in, in, you know indicates or the, you know, the trial suggests that, you know, um, uh, you know, bypass approach first, but I don't think people made this leap yet. We're not there yet. It's knowing that there's some, you know, anatomic considerations that we still need to look into, you know, you know short lesions and such. So um, I think it, it just made, and I think from an education perspective, that's probably the biggest thing. We have, a, you know, joint IR and, and vascular surgery meetings that we talk to our trainees about the importance of knowing the vein conduit and knowing when to, you know, when to venture into a complex procedure and not having to do, you know, more advanced, you know, um, endo if you know the patient has a vein conduit. So, this is where we are. I mean, it could be still controversial, but this is what we've concluded so far. And then the basal two comes in. So it just gives, it gives you a pause of, of, of if you have, you know, isolated infopopitial disease, what to do with it. So we'll, we'll discuss this more, I'm sure. Yeah, great, great comments. I mean, I, I know in the last six weeks, I had three patients where I had them on the table. I did an angiogram and I said, gosh, this is a hell of an endovascular procedure. And I'm going to have some surgical eyes on this and some vein mapping before I take it on. And Two of them went for bypass surgery and one came back to me um, on a separate occasion. And, and I felt really good about those decisions. And so I think I share a lot of your perspective there. And, you know, I think it's definitely making a difference on my practice. It sounds like it is on yours. And we're all figuring, figuring out how it fits in. But um, really important points you make um, in particular about vein mapping. So wonderful. So um, I'm going to now take the opportunity to uh, bring on the recording from Professor Bradbury. Again, it's quite late in London right now. So we have a um, really wonderful taping that he did specific for this conversation. And we'll uh, pull that up currently. Remember, please put in um, chat questions for us to um, directly answer during the rest of the session. I'd like to thank the Viva Foundation for giving me the opportunity to present on the uh, Basel II trial on behalf of the Basel II investigators. I have uh, no disclosures. The Basel II trial was published in The Lancet in April, and the aim of the study was to compare the clinical and cost effectiveness of a vein bypass first with the best endovascular treatment first revascularization strategy in terms of preventing major above the ankle amputation and or death in CLTI patients who require an infrapopliteal with or without a femoropopliteal revascularization procedure to restore limb perfusion. We also undertook a health economic evaluation to compare the cost effectiveness and cost utility of the two arms. This is the headline slide, which shows an intention to treat analysis of amputation pre-survival in the two trial arms. And what we found was that patients randomized to vein bypass first were around a third more likely to require major amputation and or die during a medium follow-up of 40 months. The adjusted hazard ratio is 1.35 with 95% confidence intervals 1.02 to 1.8, giving us a p-value of 0.037. There was no evidence of non-proportional hazards regarding the excess risk throughout the period of follow-up. This is the kaplan meier of time to first uh, amputation, and you can see that limb salvage is around 75% at five years in both groups 
but there were low numbers of risk at that time because most of the patients had deceased by five years. There was no difference in level of amputation between the two arms. So the main difference in the amputation-free survival observed was due to excess deaths with vein bypass, and you can see the hazard ratio here. Some reflections and questions from a UK National Health Service context and perspective. The National Health Service was founded shortly after the Second World War in the UK and is funded entirely by general taxation with universal coverage free at the point of delivery. We spend about £150 billion a year and that's about 8 to 10 percent of GDP. Is preventing death now as great, if not a greater challenge than preventing amputation? With the median survival in Basel II was around five years, which was very similar to the Basel I trial, where patients were treated between 1999 and 2003. The limb salvage around 75% of five years looks superficially quite good, but as pointed out, most of the patients are deceased by then. Unsurprisingly, patients prioritize survival as a key utility from their treatment and often prioritize it above limb salvage. There's general agreement in the UK that amputation-free survival was the best uh, primary endpoint to use. And it suggests that UK vascular surgeons and interventional radiologists need to take a more holistic approach to care and research of this difficult patient group. Unfortunately, it seems that what we can offer, at least in the UK, is too often too little too late. 90% of the CLTO patients in the UK present with often advanced tissue loss at first presentation. Around a third have bilateral CLTI. Many patients at presentation are not deemed suitable for revascularization by the vascular multidisciplinary team. At least 25% are still smoking, around two thirds have diabetes, overwhelmingly type 2, and around 50% of those patients are on insulin. Diabetic control and lipid lowering therapy at presentation is often poor, sometimes very poor. So in the UK, there seem to be multiple missed opportunities in primary care and public health in terms of lifestyle interventions and education, dealing with issues like smoking, alcohol, diet and obesity, implementation of best medical therapy. And we clearly need to diagnose PAD and CLTI earlier and encourage earlier specialist referrals so they have the opportunity for earlier intervention. Are the Basel II outcomes probably real and a fair reflection of what can be realistically achieved in the UK? Well, we would say yes. Basel II was funded entirely by the UK government through NIHR. The funding was about $2.5 million and we have remained within budget. NIHR it aims to identify the most clinically and cost-effective care for the NHS. Around 90% of UK vascular units contributed patients to the trial, and so it really was a national effort. It was a pragmatic trial with as few patient exclusion criteria as possible. We chose not to perform credentialing of centres, vascular surgeons and radiologists, as we felt the trial and the trial results had to reflect UK NHS real-world practice and outcomes to be useful to the UK government and policymakers to aim to improve the UK health of the nation. Are the results only applicable to a particular subgroup of CLTI patients? Yes, and this is very important because CLTI is a highly heterogeneous condition. So the Basel trial is specifically relevant to those CLTI patients who require an infrapopoteal with or without a femoropopoteal revascularization. The Basel prospective cohort study suggests around 20 to 25 percent of all CLTI patients presenting in the UK will be offered this type of revascularization. Enrollment in Basel II required three forms of equipoise. There had to be multidisciplinary team clinical, if you like, intellectual equipoise that neither vein bypass nor best endovascular therapy were obviously better. There also had to be logistical, if you like, operational uh, equipoise that vein bypass and best endovascular therapy could be delivered equally well in a timely manner. And of course, very important, the patient had to be in equipoise supported by their patient, by their family. That is, the patient and their family had to be happy to be randomized. Now, factors impacting this triple equipoise is likely to vary between centers, even within a single country, likely to vary between countries, 
and will be affected almost certainly by the type of healthcare system that is employed in that country to deliver healthcare. Is the finding of uh, a better outcome with best endovascular therapy uh, statistically and scientifically convincing? Well, as I've shown you, the adjusted uh, amputation free survival and an intention to treat analysis, the hazard ratio is 1.35 with a confidence of it, as you can see there. So if we were to run this trial more over and over again in the UK sampling from the same types of patients, the most likely outcome we would see is that an infrapeptoteal vein bypass first revascularization strategy was associated with a roughly one third increase in no amputation free survival, a 2% increase and an 80% increase in no amputation free survival with vein bypass are the least likely outcomes. But most of this range of possible likely outcomes represent a clinically important difference in favor of best endovascular therapy. And there's only about a 2% chance that the trial could have shown vein bypass to be associated with a better outcome in amputation free survival. So in the UK, there seems to be general acceptance that this is a genuine, scientifically and statistically robust outcome that is clinically meaningful to patients. Lastly, just a few words about the health economics, which are also supportive of the clinical findings. We found, as others have, that vein bypass consumes greater resources than endovascular therapy. And we also found that health-related quality of light outcomes were somewhat better in the best endovascular first group. This shows the Basel II cost-effectiveness plane were years alive without amputation, that's amputation-free survival, out to seven years post-randomization. And what this shows is that BET dominates vein bypass. In other words, vein bypass has a better outcome in terms of amputation-free survival and is also less costly to the National Health Service. If we look at the cost utility plane for quality adjusted life years out to three years, again, we see that best endovascular therapy dominates vein bypass. And if we look at the cost effectiveness acceptability curve, we show that best endovascular therapy is highly cost effective option for these patients across a wide range of willingness to pay thresholds. So in summary, will this change practice in the UK? In the UK, about 25% of patients will be offered IP with or without FP revascularization. Up to 25% will be recommended to have vein bypass on the basis of fitness for surgery, availability of good conduit and anatomic extent and severity of disease. About 25% will be recommended to have best endovascular therapy first on the basis of similar criteria. But in the remaining patients, there is no strong vascular MDT recommendation for either vein bypass or BET. And following Basel II, it seems that such patients, at least in the UK, are more likely to be offered best endovascular therapy first rather than vein bypass. Thank you again for the opportunity to present these data on behalf of the Basel II investigators. Great. Thanks again um, for Professor Bradbury, who again is not with us tonight because of the time difference, but I think that was a very important conversation that he uh, recorded. I was actually in attendance at Charing Cross when he presented this and um, I thought he did a fantastic job. You know, I, before we kick off some questions, I just wanted to get Alec and Matt's uh, thoughts. I mean, having known this was on the horizon, um, were you surprised or aware of how these results were look and look and, and how do you um, just off the cuff fit this into the context of best? Well, I, I think, you know, we, uh, um, talked to Dr. Bradbury for, for, for decades. He was actually instrumental in, in advice and in, in designing the best CLI trial. Uh, I think that these results are certainly different from what we found, but I think it's important to understand that um, the, there's a lot of differences between these two trials. Basal II is much smaller. Uh, uh, it is the patients in it are different than the ones in best CLI. Uh, the uh, risk of uh, surgery for, is much higher. 
and they don't do well. And I think what we need to do is figure out, um, you know, uh, what that means. So uh, Professor Bradbury, Matt and I and Kenny are going to take a look at our data together and do a propensity match to try to identify a basal like subset within best CLI and see how they did. That's that's on the horizon. That's a very important uh, thing that's coming out of our uh, the, the the work that we're about to do. Um, uh, you know, and so we're either going to identify a group of patients who really don't do well with surgery, and that would be a wonderful thing to know, or we're going to find out that uh, the health systems between the United Kingdom and the United States, North America, are highly different. Great. Well. You know, I think there is, you know, probably a, a, some truth in both trials, a lot of truth in both trials. I think that will be important for us, uh, what you proposed. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what comes next of this. As, as we dive into it, you know, Peter, I'm going to throw the first question to you. I mean, one difference, and I know you'll cover this in your talk, but one difference in the populations is really the focus on infrainguinal versus infrapopetial. And, and in your practice, um, how do you think about these patients different, the isolated infrapopetial or the um, treated infrainguinal disease and now only focus on infrapopetial versus that real multi-level DLTI patient? Yeah, that, that's an important factor. I think that's probably driving some of these results um, in terms of the fact that for best, for best CLI, it included patients with infrainguinal disease in general and with the um, basal two, it's it's stipulated that the patient had to have um, tibial disease requiring treatment. So when I think of patients whose tibial disease is causing their CLTI, or at least one of the main causes, I'm thinking of a higher likelihood of tissue loss, a higher likelihood of being diabetic, higher chance that the patient would have renal insufficiency, maybe renal failure. I also think of lower patencies. I anticipate that endovascular treatments and open treatments, uh, femtib bypass is probably not going to have the same long-term patency as a fempop bypass, for example. And then also this issue of the vein, whereas we we made a, an important requirement about the status of the vein in the best CLI trial. In the basal trial, it wasn't quite as clear, and yet with infrapopliteal treatments, if you're gonna do bypass, vein is really so much more important than, um, than in the fempop segment where a prosthetic actually can yield some reasonable results. So a lot of differences there based on that need for the presence of infrapopliteal disease for basal two. I have a question from the audience, and um, and this was directed to the SLIPIs. Maybe Matt, you can take that. It's it's basically a follow up on this, um, and about the uh, I mean you I mean, we mentioned it in the trial probably the uh, the percentage of patients who had a, a fem tibial or fem distal bypass, and if there were different outcomes for the patient who had a fem pop, and um, you know the experience, and you know probably Peter alluded to it, and the question was the the experience level needed to, to do these um, uh, distal bypasses. I think you're muted, Matt. Matt, we still got you on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. No, super good question. Um, see here, and um, you know, we're gonna dive into the, the specifics of the different anatomic reconstructions that's that's forthcoming we do know about 40 percent of, of folks had a tibial level or pedal level bypass i think peter's point is extremely important um you know there's a whole bunch of different ways to compare any two trials but certainly a trial that two trials that have disparate results you know one is just both sides throw a bunch of tomatoes at the other side about how terrible the other study was you know the other is to do the, the kind of first level comparison about how they're different. Peter touched on a few, a couple and Alec did as well. Another important one is that 5% of folks in BEST had a prior intervention on the index leg, and that was 35% in basal without any real sense at the moment of what those prior interventions were. You know, it could have been a 
a series of failed endos that would have put them at high risk. Or so, you know, there's real differences that need to, to happen. The best way to do it is some sort of stratified analysis that Alec alluded to, where we identify what were the risk factors for the bad outcomes in one trial and then use those to kind of predict the outcome in, in the second trial and and then vice versa. So we're going to do that um, and hopefully that'll be uh, illuminating. But, um, you know, I, I think they are very different trials and, and you know, whether it's going to come down to the treatment uh, kind of biases or the treatment uh, of the two different healthcare systems, you know, versus biology, you know, versus one being real, one being chance, I think is all kind of to be determined, but, you know, really important questions to try to understand. Great. Well, Sahir, I'm going to turn this back to you, actually, uh, for a question we received. And, you know, I think in a lot of specialties and a lot of procedural um, uh, practices, volume is important. And I imagine that is the same for surgical bypass um, as it is for endovascular treatment. You know, when speaking with Professor Bradbury after the Basel II presentation, you know, his comment about the fact that 84% of endo was done by interventional radiologists in the UK, 73% of endo was done by vascular surgeons in the US. Is it time that we explore whether there is a proficiency component to both practices? But maybe I'll ask you specifically about endo based on your specialty. You know, I think that this is in time where we should be exploring who and how to do procedures. And I know, again, for Professor Bradbury, he said that he doesn't do endo and they really defer all their endovascular procedures to IR. And they have a different payment scale. There's, you know, everybody's paid salary through the NHS similarly. So it's not a, a much of a, a conflict there. And so uh, any, any insights on that? Yeah, I mean, and definitely. I think Matt touched on this in his, in his uh, talk about the critiques. And I think the a few things that to mention there, the percentage success, I mean, was, was equivalent between two trials and, you know, mostly done by two different specialties. And, you know, so, I mean, I think I hate it when after the basal came out, people started talking and, you know, like who did the procedure or not. And I mean, and, and you saw some some data um, from, from Japan about, about their study for, for these class three and the success rate. I mean, it seems to be consistent. So, I mean, I think all this all this idea about trying to kind of claim that somebody you know can do the procedure better based on specialty alone is is, is thrown out the window. Um, and I think that's why it's all about competency and and, and knowledge of of what's available. And I think that's uh, the tools that are available, how to take care of the patients, and the data that's available and implementing it. So I think that's the most important message that needs to come out of this: is you need to embrace this disease. You need to know everything about this disease. Not just a procedure, as Josh mentioned before, how to care for the patient and, and who to in, include in it. Um, so I think that's from an Indo um, competency. Definitely, you need to be a high-level, you know, um, uh, practitioner to, to take care of these patients, and uh, not just to be skillful technically, but to know the, the knowledge about it. So, you know, how we establish this is something that we need to, you know, look at and, and definitely improve in tra our training paradigms. But also the bypass path, and that's not what I asked Matt about. It. And I think we talked to Vinita about it in, in, in the past, and, and, and she could probably can give some insight on this of, you know, how many vascular surgeons uh, do we need to are very skilled at distal bypass, especially when talking about the basal two and the mostly infrapopliteal, you know, is this, is this trained in, are they being trained enough? And I can tell you that many, many times you send a, you know, a patient to a vascular surgeon to turn around and they get, end up being treated in the vascular rather than the bypass. And it's a, you hear this uh, all the time. So it's something that needs to be addressed about, you know, the competency in, in these distal bypasses. Do we have enough people who can do them, um, you know, professionally as, as well as the endo component of it? I don't know if you have any comments on this. Yeah, great comment. And again, I, I can just echo the comment that there are fantastic endovascular specialists from all procedural backgrounds and taxonomies. And so it's not about who you are, it's about your dedication to this specialty. So I agree completely. Um, Josh, I'm going to flip it to you. You know, I think one thing that came out um, of the primary endpoint in Basel II, amputation free survival, was the dominance of the difference in mortality, in particular early on. Um, and we didn't see that dominant difference in mortality in Bestialite. That was really then point driven primarily by major reintervention. How do you reconcile then and, and weigh those differences? 
Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is um, I think we need to step back and just say both trials are true. And the reason that we don't understand why some of the differences have come out in the way they have is that we don't understand everything about the patients that were enrolled and the different systems of healthcare uh, and the strategies that were applied. We're going to figure out this, the differences and the similarities. We have a variety of ways of doing that. And any goal, any plan or uh, aim to try and downplay one or find faults, particularly in the other, in my opinion, is stupid. I think we are lucky to have these two large trials done in different places on a very similar, if not identical, set of patients. So I tried to figure out the mortality question to understand if these patients were really that different, calling out an age difference of a few years, some more diabetes here, some more heart disease there. But basically at two years, the death rate in both trials was 25%. Both trials had the same death rate at 25%. So was the, so then you gotta say to yourself, all right, what's going on in the first 30 days, which is where there's a lot of screaming and hollering well, it turns out best CLI was a little bit low and uh, Basel II was a bit high. But if you take a look at some of the really large studies, just looking at outcomes, POISE one, POISE two, vision, these are not done to figure out specific outcomes in vascular surgery, but the lower extremity, 30 days, uh, lower extremity surgery, 30 day survival, um, you know, there was a mortality rate of about three and a half percent, sort of smack dab in the middle. And so I don't think the surgeons in the United Kingdom and the single sites in the other European countries are bad. I don't think that the endovascular providers in the United States are better or worse. I just think that this is sort of how human research goes, right? Each trial had a significant loss to follow up of their patients, primarily because of sites or, or costs it was going to take to find them. Loss to follow up patients, if you look at the VQI data, impact really importantly, particularly on amputation and mortality. So I think both trials are true, and we're going to try and figure out over time if there are, if there are specific subgroups that may benefit from one procedure or the other. But my take home message here is either therapy makes people feel better and helps them save their limbs. And the right therapy is probably shouldn't be called the right therapy. What we're trying to do is figure out appropriate therapies on the basis of patient characteristics and operator characteristics. And there's, there's no reason to pit one trial versus the other. So it's a tremendous amount of work has gone into doing these. And human research is never perfect. What's going on now is we have to get smarter and wait for the granular understanding of each of these trials that will come with the dozens of publications we all anticipate from both of them. So I think the mortality is fine. I'm sorry that it was a bit high uh, in, in Basel II and it was a bit low in best CLI. And you can have explanations one way or the other, but it doesn't really matter because in two years, everybody was the same. These are the same patients. They're not exactly the same, uh, but we'll figure out the differences in the important ways as we begin to figure out who should maybe go one way, who should go another, and how we can have smart conversations for shared decision making with our patients on the basis of some of the things that come out. So again, mortality is exactly what I expected at two years. I can't, you know, you look at the survival at five and seven years and you say to yourself, this is the cancer of vascular disease. Uh, and so it's, it's how you just pay attention to the bigger picture, and then you fill in the details. Both procedures make you feel better. Both procedures help you keep your limbs. And some patients will, will do better with surgery, and some will do better with endo. And we're going to figure that out.
Now, one of the things that Peter brought up, and I have a question I'm going to ask Vanita because she's been too quiet. But I want to ask Vanita, of the patients you see with CLTI, how many of them walk in and have high quality vein that you would then consider because of the vein doing surgery? Uh, that's a great question, Josh. Um, and I will say we're, we're looking at that now much more regularly at this point, maybe 25% at best at high quality vein. I don't know if And so I wonder what the difference is there. Like, you know, I, the, the requirement for suitable vein in basil two, how many people have suitable vein? And I don't even know what the difference is between suitable vein and high quality vein. Um, and you know, if there's some way to, I think that's actually an important question to understand, but I think it's really important that if it's 20% or 30% or 40%, that already tells you a lot about the people who are in the trial. And that's really important. So you've got to look for high quality vein, but you can't expect it to be there all the time. That is one tiny marker of the many markers that we are going to figure out over the next year or so as papers are, as data is analyzed and papers are published. And I can't wait to understand those differences. Well, I think just even understanding how and how we describe and define adequate vein is a big question as well and, and not necessarily consistent. So you make a really great point. Yeah. And I, I remember, Alec, you made a comment recently on another session we were on about searching more for the surgical patient instead of searching for the endo patient, you know, and trying to find those who do have the vein that we can have a meaningful conversation with. And again, it makes decisions a little bit different if that vein doesn't exist. You know, and I'll, I'll also represent our president of Viva Foundation, Raghu Kalori, who's messaging me that we need to defend our veins as well. And um, in his practice, he's seen too much ablation and treatment of, of venous conduits that could be useful in the future. And I don't think that message um, has really made it to the public and, and is another really important take home from both of these trials. But before we wrap up this portion and move to Peter's um, talk, you know, Vinny, I want to bounce it back to you. You know, one one thing that has come up, and we've gotten some questions about this, is the representativeness of VASCO trials in general. Uh, and we've seen far too long that um, women and uh, minority patients are underrepresented, typically making up twenty five to thirty five percent of clinical trial populations. What what's next? How do we well, how do we solve this issue? Because I know the FDA is keen on this. Um, we're keen on this. Um, what, what happens next in the trial landscape? Yeah, Eric, I think that's a great question and a, and a difficult one to answer. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think we can make sort of sweeping, um, conclusions with these trials when they're underrepresenting these cohorts, right? I mean, and, and, and you can time and time again, we've seen trials, um, with the underrepresented of underrepresentation of these cohorts and then with worse outcomes and then all of these added questions, right? So is it lack of access? Is it delayed um, presentation, et cetera, et cetera? So I think there's huge unanswered questions. And as much as there's been a push to try to really um, emphasize enrollment, um, and I know that um, in Best CLI, you tried very, very hard and still were a little bit under what you were hoping at, what was it, 28 percent, so to speak. I don't know. I mean, maybe um, intentionality with, you know, focused studies on these subgroups may be one of the only ways we can really understand the natural history, for example, in women and, and minorities. Maybe um, I, I just worry about just sub-analyses, which I look forward to, don't get me wrong, in these big studies. But I think we're going to have to be much more intentional to really understand these cohorts as potentially completely different pathophysiologies and, and, and different patient profiles. Yeah, you know, I think um, upcoming studies like Elegance from Boston Scientific Life, BTK from Abbott, had you know really intentional content um, and site selection to achieve metrics of um, representation. But again, resources are different when it's an industry-funded trial versus an AH trial. And I think again, we are really happy that we have the evidence we do, but we need to keep it in the context of who made it into the trial. So, 
on that note, you know, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who um, um, recorded his presentation for us, but it's here live um, to follow it up. Really taking, again, the next deep dive into comparing why, and Josh has nice comments, both of these trials are right in their own ways. And so um, looking forward to your talk, Peter. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Schneider, and it's a pleasure to be here with you as we consider how this um, amazing data drop that just occurred between the best CLI and the basal two will be used to affect our practices and inform our practices about CLTI. So these are my disclosures. I do some consulting for a variety of companies, some of which are also interested in this area. I also was a participant in the best CLI, uh, both enrolling patients and as a participant in one of the committees. Well, here are the primary endpoints for best CLI and basal two. I think everybody has seen these at this point. Uh, the major adverse limb events or death uh, was the endpoint for the uh, best CLI trial. And you can see that for bypass, it was 43% endovascular, 57% at about two and a half years. And then with uh, basal two, it was amputation free survival. So death or major amputation occurred after 63% of the bypass patients and 53% of the endovascular patients. So these are uh, results that are seemingly at odds. Uh, there are differences in these trials and I'm gonna just give you my take on what these differences mean and how they might have occurred. So here is the rate of major amputation uh, with endovascular and bypass in the two trials. The good news is that the vast majority of the limbs that presented in, and were treated in both trials could be saved. So the amputation uh, freedom or freedom from amputation was anywhere from 80 to 90%, which is I think something we can be proud of. Keep in mind that both of these trials or these two trials had a little bit different time frames, 2.7 years versus 40 months. So what about the best CLI results in context? So the fact that we use death or major adverse limb events shows a separation of the curves immediately. So the major adverse limb events were primarily powered by a crossover or a conversion of endovascular patients to bypass. The number of amputations and the number of deaths were relatively similar between the two groups. And so the main difference in the primary endpoint <clears throat> was driven by the um, conversion to bypass. And this is an important thing to remember going forward um, because this uh, endpoint is one that uh, we're gonna be seeing again and we have to understand completely. So the best CLI results in context, we also um, need to uh, consider this idea of how these endovascular patients got converted to a bypass. So you can see that a major intervention in the index limb, that would be a bypass occurred in 23.5%. Uh, some of this was driven by technical failure. We're gonna learn a lot more about technical failure in the endo group, but the um, technical failure was around 15% uh, in this group. Now these bypasses were determined by the trial site investigator. And although they were evaluated uh, uh, sort of post hoc by an independent uh, committee, I think we need to learn a little bit more about this since this was the primary driver of the best CLI results. As a comparator, if you think about CDTLR, which is frequently used as an endpoint in IDE device trials, um, it typically includes specific parameters, recurrence of symptoms, decreased hemodynamics, and angiographic evidence of uh, residual or recurrent disease. And these are uh, things that are typically, you have to accumulate all three of these for it to be considered a CDTLR. So what were these factors in the uh, endo patients that were converted to bypass? So technical success, again, we mentioned, but one of the um, issues of technical failure is inability to cross. So we had evolving technology during the time frame of the enrollment, which some of which helps to uh, uh, cross occluded lesions. And one of these is retrograde access. So we know anti-grade crossing has a failure rate of 15 to 20%. And so we need to look at those technical failures 
which I mentioned that we would, we just don't have that information yet. And so uh, what about this best CLI population? Well, the enrolling team had to believe that there was equipoise, that the patient was an equally good candidate for both endovascular intervention and bypass. And what this speaks to is the anatomic severity of the disease, but also the fitness for open surgery. The patient had to have equipoise with respect to both of these. And I'll just say that if you kind of stylize these or imagine these on a graph where fitness for open surgery is on the up and down axis and disease morphology is on the horizontal axis. If you can imagine that some, a patient who's very straightforward for an endovascular approach is not gonna have equipoise with open surgery since open surgery is a, uh, is a bigger procedure. And likewise, those who are at too high risk for open surgery, there's not gonna be equipoise, even if there's severe disease morphology, most of us would say, we should uh, go for endo first in that group. And so the best CLI population is somewhere in this area. And this is uh, sort of the definition of selection bias, which is true for all randomized trials. We have strict inclusion exclusion criteria in this equipoise, although very practical because this is what we operate on in a practice by practice, site by site way as we see these CLTI patients. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to enroll all CLTI patients when this equipoise is a requirement. So this selection bias, those who are straightforward for endo and or older, sicker, et cetera, were likely excluded. So how big of a box or how big of a group of patients was this? There's a lot more information coming and this, there is already a 61 page supplement and there are numerous studies on the way. So let's look at basal. So we looked at, uh, we said amputation free survival was a primary endpoint. But uh, the 10 point difference between bypass and endo was mostly driven by mortality, an eight point difference between bypass being higher and endovascular being lower. We don't really know why that is, but we have some hints. I mean, here's the perioperative mortality, which was substantially higher, three times higher or more in the bypass group in basal two than in the best CLI uh, perioperative mortality. Um, it was also uh, higher in the endovascular group and keep in mind that the patients who were entered in basal two were older. They were probably sicker because they had to have a six month life expectancy versus the longer life expectancy uh, anticipated in the best patients. Uh, we also can look at long term mortality. These are different time points, 40 months versus 2.7 years. So it's roughly two and a half years versus uh, three and uh, a quarter years. But you can see that these mortality rates are pretty substantial, 53% um, after uh, bypass for basal two, that's the one that stands out the most. And um, we have our work cut out for us. So here's major amputation or death, and it ranges from 43% to 63% in these four cohorts. But let's also look at the medical management and the uh, comorbidities. So substantial number of these patients were diabetic, diabetics. And this of course uh, is consistent with all of our experiences, but there, it, it's an avalanche that we're facing of diabetes and these incidences will likely increase. So how these patients are treated and managed up until the time that they develop CLTI is really important. Many current smokers, uh, more in best CLI than in basal two, but that's pretty substantial up to 37% in the bypass group of best CLI. Not all the patients were on antiplatelets, not all the patients were on cholesterol lowering. So there's a lot that we could do to reduce amputation and reduce mortality in these patients. So key differences between basal two and best CLI, the best CLI was substantially larger. Uh, the basal two, the patients were quite a bit older, had more tissue loss. 100% of them had tibial disease that required treatment. Um, the Technical success was relatively similar in the endo groups between the two and also the crossover. So the uh, endo patients that ended up with a bypass were 19% in the basal two, 23.5 <clears throat> in the best CLI. So the basal two patients are older, sicker, and have more tibial disease. And if the crossover to bypass had been considered part of the endpoint, as opposed to simply amputation-free survival, the difference uh, would have been substantial. So let's look again now. We already said that the best CLI group is somewhere in this uh, quadrant. 
uh, the basal two patients being older, sicker, more tissue loss, and more tibial disease, I would say they were definitely higher risk for surgery with that higher perioperative mortality. They might have also had more challenging for endo because of the fact that they all had tibial disease. We're going to learn more about this. There's a, a tremendously well thought out uh, a priori data sharing agreement, which really helps us all in the sense that uh, these patients now, the best CLI patients and the basal two patients could be compared on individual patient level and potentially there's some propensity matching in our future so that we can understand where the basal two patients would reside had they been entered into the best trial and vice versa. So in conclusion, I'll just say that endo first is appropriate for many, but not all. Best CLI in the studied population bypass had an advantage, but how much advantage is not yet clear. We have to have some additional data bits with regards to severity of disease morphology and medical risk of the enrolled patients. The basal two trial in the studied patients, our studied population endo had an advantage, but it was primarily driven by the high mortality in the bypass group, something we didn't see in the best trial. So again, these patients in basal were older, sicker, et cetera. And uh, these two populations were likely different, maybe some slight overlap. I would say that saphenous vein mapping and surgical risk assessment should be applied more liberally than it had been in the era when we were mostly operating on endo first for all patients. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, uh, Peter, for that wonderful talk as always and um, getting your really uh, take on both of these trials helps put into context uh, for all of us in the vascular community. So, you know, I wanna spend our closing 10 minutes here um, on the theme of multidisciplinary vascular care. I think this was how we started the conversation. We're lucky to have um, such a diverse group on the call and I'm sure in attendance for this <coughs> webinar. Um, and so maybe Alec, I'll just start with you. You know, having run a truly multidisciplinary clinical trial, how do you do this on the local level? How do how do you incorporate um, your your different vascular and non-vascular specialties in the care of your CLTI population? Well, Eric, that's a great question. You know, if you choose to treat these patients, you really have to work as part of a team. These patients are highly complex, as shown by these by these two trials. And so you have to have somebody who manages the foot. So podiatry is extraordinarily important uh, because they really do an amazing job in, in man actually managing both wounds and foot and, and do a much better job than vascular surgeons uh, have done in the past. And so I think you have to have pod podiatry there. And then, of course, you have to work together with your, uh, in, in any given environment, you know, who is taking care of these patients. You have to have somebody who manages um, the, the medical issues surrounding these patients because these patients are highly complex from that standpoint. You have to have an endocrinologist and you have to have cardiologists or vascular medicine specialists who really focus on optimizing the care of these patients and making sure that they're medically treated uh, optimally. And then there have to be people who are trained in endovascular and there have to be people who are trained in, in open vascular surgery. Both are, uh, are, are complementary. Now, it, in some scenarios, it might be all three specialties, radiology, vascular surgery, even four specialties, vascular medicine and, uh, and vascular surgery. I remember there was one site in West Virginia who actually had four specialties who did all of those. There are other sites that it, 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 it'll not include all the specialties, but the, the relevant thing is that you have to have uh, expertise in endovascular, advanced endovascular and expertise in surgery and expertise in medicine and expertise in tissue care at the level of foot. And all these specialists have to work together uh, so as to optimize care of these patients. Wonderful. Well, Vinny, I'm gonna throw you the next question, um, jumping off that, you know, one thing, and, and Matt and I have talked about this, and just to get your perspective, you know, there are paradigms where surgical risk and endovascular risk and treatment decisions are done conjunctively between different specialties. So an example in the cardiovascular world is for um, TAVR or a endovascular percutaneous aortic valve replacement. 
how do we feel comfortable or how do we approach the idea that um, in the right patients who have a, a venous conduit that surgical um, risks and benefits are adequately represented as our endovascular? Is it down to the individual provider? Do we need more than one specialty there? How, how would you implement this into your practice? Eric, I think that's a great question. And I'm trying to remember, I was at a recent conference where there was a panel kind of discussing these issues related to these studies. And uh, on the panel was an anesthesiologist and had a very different perspective in terms of surgical risk assessment from everybody else on the panel in that basically she didn't care what anyone else said. And she made the ultimate decision sort of intraoperatively or preoperatively and the day before the operation. And she, you know, in numerous ways described reasons that, you know, were very different than what the vascular surgeon or interventionalist or cardiologist had said in terms of their risk assessment. And so I actually think we may have done this potentially approach this a little bit a little bit off and, and completely maybe forgotten the colleagues of ours that that have a lot of concern and, and thought about risk assessment. I mean the rest of us is to some degree gestalt, to some degree, you know, some of the um, data that we have out there. But it's not necessarily actually besides the actual procedural part, thinking about the, getting the patients through the anesthetic, et cetera, et cetera. And there's been a lot of advance and a lot of really amazing care on the anesthetic um, side of things. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but I do think I've made it a little more complex. No, I mean, well, part of it is a neutral, you know, not, I don't want to say neutral, but a, a specialist who, you know, is not doing either on the actual procedural side, but more on the perioperative care side. And I think that's a very important viewpoint. Yeah, I think, you know, Sahar, if I thought to you, I mean, how do you imagine you, that conversation in your practice? And, you know, I could tell you what mine would be like, but, you know, do you feel, you know, that that can be accurately represented by one specialty or, or multidisciplinary specialties or? Yeah, I mean, let, let's be frank here. I mean, so we're talking about, you know, like vascular surgeons, uh, many of them are trained or the majority of them, especially now the, the, the current uh, training paradigm, the overwhelming majority are very, very comfortable with endovascular. And uh, I would say most of them are comfortable with, with bypasses. And I asked this question about the distal bypasses because I sense this, especially in a lot of fresh grads out in practice, not as comfortable with certain types of bypasses. And that is the question that we need to, to kind of get to. But we have to be, you know, um, yeah, can one specialty, you know, manage in, in the vascular surgery world for the most part from what I'm seeing? Yeah, there's no need to in, involve another interventionist to discuss the availability if they're comfortable with the endovascular risk. I mean, this is the, the endovascular skills and this is the way it is. From an interventional radiologist, an interventional cardiologist, um, now this is the onus on you is based on these, in this data is to be cognizant of the you know, vascular uh, assessment and then and the uh, expertise um, that you have locally available to you. And uh, can this patient be better served with a, with a conduit? But I mean, this is this is where we're at. But what I really want to warn about, and as BSCLI came out and as the subsequent analysis is, there is some bravado out there, I mean, in, in meetings and in social media and what have you about that, you know, there's only one specialty that can treat this patient, nobody else can, and like every patient has to have a full assessment by, you know, a vascular surgeon. And um, and as, as I said, here as a group, we're multidisciplinary, we need to discuss this. and. I think I don't think that's the intent of the best CLI or the message that was sent from the from the PIs, but that's what some people heard, um, and they're pushing you know this narrative. So I think it's it's worth a discussion, and I think it's important for everybody to who is um, well vested, as I mentioned before, and cares well about this uh, about CLTI patients and knows how to treat them to be involved in their care, not to be marginalized. So I think it's it's worth a discussion, and and that's something that we you know we're seeing out there. And, and I hear from people out in practice and, and you know, in the comments, and I see a lot of questions about it. This was mentioned four or five times that, you know, Dr. Roshan, um, Dr. Gornick and Dr. Espinosa and several others sent really thoughtful comments about, we are worried about tribalism getting somewhat worse. We're almost getting back to 20 years ago when people are going into silos. And I don't think that was the message that needed to come out of Best CLI, but this is an issue. Um, that needs to be that needs to be addressed, and uh, we need to kind of try to bridge gaps and, and kind of you know minimize this bravado and, and kind of get back together. So I think it's a it's an important message that comes out of it, and seems to be struck struck a chord because it's been mentioned several times in the chat here. So I know Josh, you know you had several times, and I know you had some strong thoughts on it too. 
I'm going to, I'm going to throw it to Josh in a second. And, and Matt also, I want to have your comments here. I mean, I, I think one thing Matt that you presented and we have, I'm not going to putting in my cardiovascular cap. We have these heart team meetings for cabbage versus corner intervention for complex patients. And you know, what we used to do when I was a fellow and I make our fellows do is we calculate exactly what Matt said. And I was proud that you brought it up was the syntax score. And it gave us some objective metrics and we had STS risk scores as well for surgical bypass. And we were able to give some more quantitative um, numbers to patients that allowed for us to be hopefully a little bit more objective. But, you know, Matt, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you first and then Josh, I'm gonna give you the last question. Hearing what Sire said and, and you know, you've been again around the world talking about this, you were on the stage, um, you know, talking about this in November. How do you how do you put everybody together? How do we, how do we bring the community closer together instead of farther apart around these data? Yeah, is that to me, Eric? Is that yeah, that's to you, Matt. And then yeah, Josh will wrap. No, no, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I I feel passion passionately about this, and I I just think you know we're last in line in terms of being the model uh, of how it should have been done over the last twenty years, and I, I just you know, I think it's a byproduct of how kind of the field has evolved over the last 25 years, but I think it is so, so counterproductive, so destructive to kind of good patient care because people just come at it with their own bias. And, and that's the reason why these trials are so important because in the absence of data, you can do whatever you, the heck you want and, and no one can really refute it because there's no evidence and it's the reason why we're so far behind the oncology world and the cardiology world, because you guys just do great trials left, right, and center, and you answer specific questions, and then that gets disseminated, and that just hasn't hasn't happened. And you know, I it started out as sort of real tribalism, kind of vascular surgery versus cardiology, primarily radiology were sort of the the peacemakers between the two, but it evolved into an open versus endo, um, which is just insane. It's truly insane. Um, and the real challenge going forward is just to completely dispense with that. There are two effective treatment options that should not ever be pitted against each other. And I don't care what specialty you are, you have to just realize that. And if you don't like it, you know, that's tough because it's, it's not, if you care about the patient, then you need to care about you know, what's effective and, you know, no one knows the answer. And the most effective strategy is to get all the folks in your hospital that know about this disease together and, and kind of figure it out. You know, it's as simple as that, that to me, whether there's vein there or not, you know, whether they're high surgical risk or not, you know, that's all part of the mix. You, you figure it out based on the, the individual patient. So that's my, my take on it. Wonderful. I think those are great comments. Josh, I'm going to leave you with the last question. Um, you played a very important role in, in many spaces, one of which is um, in the society guidelines. We are in the process of finalizing the upcoming update to the ACC AHA multidisciplinary guidelines on peripheral artery disease. Knowing what you and hearing what you've heard tonight, knowing what you know about these trials, if, if you had to summarize for the audience how guidelines look moving forward, what are the key positions you would take in the guidelines document, having this evidence in front of you now? So I think it's really important for me to say first, I am not on the writing committee. Uh, and the writing committee is charged with making these decisions and every single difficult decision is literally a tug of rope, a tug of war amongst a variety of positions and a variety of people. And we try us and the collaborating organizations to put people in the room who we trust and then we leave them alone. So there are surgeons and cardiologists and there are non-invasive people and invasive people and the, the group will find some middle point. The second thing I'm going to say is they're going to get it wrong. Why are they going to get it wrong? Because they're people and there is no getting it right because everybody will be somewhat upset about something. And our understanding of these trials in the next year or two 
is going to change dramatically as we get more data. So no matter what we say now, it's going to be wrong. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't say something, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to use all the information we have. It is one reason why the organizations are trying to do more frequent maintenance updates, moving it closer to every year or two, so that no decision is final for half a decade or more. Now, if you ask my own personal opinion, and I am not on the writing committee, here's what I take home from these trials. One, it is a class one recommendation. You've got to revascularize CLTI patients if you can do it. It saves limbs. It makes people feel better. That's pretty obvious. And I'll say that with the combination now of the two trials and my own personal lack of understanding to know which is the right person in the right setting, I would make the techniques each a 2A. That is right for right now. That may not be right in 30 days when there are more papers out, three months or a year, but there is nobody that can tell me the exact differences except that there are differences between the two trial populations. So that tells me I don't know. So I would be very firm on revascularizing and I would hedge accepting both as true in the way that I would write a guideline. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a wonderful perspective to end on again from um, an esteemed vascular specialist um, who doesn't do these procedures, which I think are, is really important perspective. I want to thank everyone for a really stimulating conversation. Alec and Matt, you guys are wonderful. I know how many engagements you've been asked to participate in um, and making time for us on a second round now is really meaningful. I want to again remind everyone, this is the home for multidisciplinary vascular care, Viva Foundation. That is what this foundation represents. And so I hope that we all can agree that these are landmark trials that are shaping all of our practices moving forward. We are incredibly proud to have participated in the best registry and to support science like this. And I want to remind everyone that we have our upcoming meeting, October 28th starts veins, October 30th starts Viva in Vegas. And I would encourage everyone to register because it will be a fantastic program. And there's obviously more conversations, more data that will come out at that time. So. Thank you everyone for spending your evening with us. Really appreciate everybody's perspectives and I hope you have a wonderful night.